helping people cope with and overcome life's challenges. This is Life Transformations with Michael Hart, Canadian Certified Counselor and Award-Winning Psychotherapist. Hi, this is Michael Hart of Elam Counseling Services, and I want to thank you for joining us in this edition of the Life Transformation Radio Show. Today we have another interesting show lined up for you. Today's show is about surviving in a dysfunctional relationship, and it's not just about couples relationship, it's about relationship of any kind. And so we're going to be covering a number of key aspects and sharing with you seven points, seven things that you should do to be able to survive in a dysfunctional relationship. And with me in studio today to discuss this very, very important uh, topic is Melissa. Welcome, Melissa, and thank you very much for joining us again on the Life Transformation Radio Show. It's great to see you again, Michael, and I'm so happy to be in studio with you today. It's a pleasure. It wouldn't be the same without you here, and I think it's always fun to be able to hear your, how you explore the issues with your questions. And I think um, many listeners have commented about the, the way in which we present information through this format. And, and so I, I think you're doing a good job. Thank you very much. It's all, like I say, part of the fun of doing this with Michael is we are friends outside of this. So it's really great to pick his brain and to get that information out as, as best I can. So for those listeners who have questions that they've been dying to ask, that they want me to ask on their behalf, we do encourage you to contact us through our website at elamcounselingministry.com. Elam is spelled E-L-I-M, counseling with two L's, ministry.com. Or you can call us at 613-699-1677. You also can look us up on our Facebook page or on our Twitter feed as well. So if there's something you've been dying for me to ask, Michael, you've been on the edge of your seat since you've started listening to the show, um, put your questions there and I'd be happy to pose them to the man himself uh, when I get the opportunity. All right. I think Melissa likes putting me on the spot, so she That's can't really wait for is. you to send in your, <laughs> Make your, them di- tough. your difficult questions. We'd also like to remind listeners of an upcoming event, Melissa. So now I'm going to put you on the spot to tell the listeners of the event that we have coming up on September the 30th here in Ottawa. So for those of you who might be new, yes, we are here in Ottawa. And we have a very important annual event coming up on the 30th of September at the Church of God, 1820 Carling Avenue. So our faithful listeners are aware of this conference coming up on September 30th, as Michael said, at the Church of God on Carling Avenue. This year's conference is all about um, first love, and it's going to be broken into three different segments throughout the day. So um, in the morning, we will feed you. You'll get a continental breakfast starting at 830 and the day will run until 12. But the first segment of the conference is all about getting reconnected with self-love and healthy self-love. So we're not going to be breeding narcissists in the conference, right, right Michael? And I think that is so important uh, because a lot of people can get to this place where they they confuse humility oh, they, they confuse self-love with pride, I should say. And so a lot of Christians uh, do not have a healthy love for themselves. But uh, the scripture presupposes that we have a healthy self-love. When Jesus says, for example, that we are, we are to love others as we love ourselves, if you don't love yourself, then you can't really love others. And I think a lot of people can't love in romantic relationships because they have self-love issues. And they can't love God because they have self-love issues. And so we are going to be exploring self-love in a way that helps people to get back in touch with healthy self-love. And self-love sometimes is is damaged because of things like shame, shame of things that was done to you in the past or shame of things that you have done or it can be damaged by negative self-concept that we have developed as a result of lies that was spoken over us like if you have been told that you're no good or you wouldn't amount to anything it's very common for people to embrace those negative self-concepts. So I think this seminar is really about freedom because uh, people are going to be set free from these negative things like shame and negative self-concept and low self-esteem. And I think there there is going to be a uh, breakthrough in a, for a number of people in, in these areas and people are going to, to get to this place of healthy self-love. And so the healthy self-love will serve as the foundation for the conference because it leads into the next topic of 
romantic love. So we've said in the past, if you're not in a couple relationship at the moment, it doesn't mean this isn't for you as well. We're going to be looking at all aspects of healthy relationships and healthy love within those settings. So if you're going to be hope to be in a relationship in the future, it still will apply to you. Yes. And then the final segment is about God love. Right. And Absolutely. what that means, because there's yes. a lot of times, as you said in the past, Michael, there's things within us that may be impacting our relationship with God that we don't even know about. yet. Right. It's so funny, but I meet people who will say things when we talk about, you know, they, they have this zeal to be really spiritual and they want to study the scriptures or, or they, you know, they want to do certain things for God. And then you get uh, talking about it and planning for it and they'll say, I just can't find the time. I don't have any time to do this as much as I'd love to do it. But then you start exploring how their how their their day is broken down. And you find that they have time for a lot of other things that are, according to them, is not as important. They will spend three, four hours, uh, five hours a week uh, watching television and, and looking at their, 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 their favorite, searching their favorite things online, but no time for the things that they say that they really want. Now, are these people uh, being dishonest or are they being disingenuous? No, it, it's simply that they are barriers there, subconscious barriers that is preventing them from spending time alone with God that they're not aware of. And we want to get into what are some of the hindrances that prevent people from from uh, doing the things that they want to do for God and just helping people to overcome those barriers. Another negative barrier is sometimes we project onto God uh, the our first parental or first uh uh, caregiver in life. So if you if you had a caregiver or a parent who was vindictive and judgmental, then you can in turn project that kind of quality unto God the Father. So it's not surprising that if you see God the Father as being judgmental, vindictive, who is out to get you, you know, with a lightning bolt if you sin, who would want to spend time and uh, and and pray for hours or, or spend time uh, alone with a God like that? So it's not uncommon for people who have these kind of images of God will say, I just can't find the time to pray. Well, it's not that you can't find the time to pray. It's that God is not appealing. You don't have a love relationship with God and you don't you don't want to spend time with him. Uh, subconsciously, because he's harsh and he's not the kind of figure that anyone anyone would gravitate towards, and uh, so we're going to be looking at these uh, issues in in a in a profound way. Uh, we have a number of speakers on hand, and these speakers are all trained psychotherapists who are also believers who who attend churches and 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 have great relationships with God. So I think God has some great thing in store. So we invite you to join us. We'd be so happy to see you on September 30th at the Church of God here in Ottawa for the First Love Conference. If you want to get your name on the registration list, you can go to our website at elamcounselingministry.com. Elam is spelled E-L-I-M, counseling with two L's, ministry.com, or call us at 613-699-1677. Get your name on that list fast. It does fill up quickly, and we'd love to see you out there. I think that's a good thing to remind listeners to do because I think it's also important to note that the, the, the cost for the conference is $25 per person, and it will remain $25 until the 1st of September when the cost will, after that, will be uh, $35 per person. So register early and come on out and get your blessing. I think God has great things in store. So, Michael, off the top, you said today we were going to be talking about surviving a dysfunctional relationship. Yes. So when we talk about dysfunctional relationships for the purposes of today's show, what kind of things are we talking about? Yes, I, I'm th- talking about relationships in which... Uh, People find that their their needs are not being met, that their values are being betrayed, that they the the situation that they got themselves they they thought they were going in in the beginning is turning out to be the opposite of what they signed up for. 
or it could be that these are kind of relationship that just uh, is 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 outside the norm of what such standard relationship should be. So it could be things like a romantic relationship with someone where you're married, you were both believers, you had certain values that you embrace, and you get into it, and you realize now the person that I thought was this mighty man of God is doing things that are contrary to our values, and it's creating a lot of of contention and a lot of chaos and there is a lot of discord and bitterness and uh, you know in those kind of relationships it can be very hard because as Christians you you it's not like just walking away from the job so that can be the most difficult one so most of what we say will pertain to that but it will also involve other types it's also good principles to deal with other types of relationships as well such as a relationship between uh, children and parents uh, sometimes we have we i see uh, clients come before me that they're from very dysfunctional households and even as adults, they are still suffering the consequences of be, of being in that of, of be, belonging to that family, and they are trying to rectify it and 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 uh, deal with it in a godly way. And they're just running into all kind of roadblocks, and I have to help them walk through these difficulties and come and you know help them to. To, to come to a place where they can resolve some of those dysfunctions. So, or it can be a, a workplace relationship as well. Some of these principles can also be applied to workplace situations. So we're talking about relationships, uh, couples general, couples in particular, but in general, uh, the principles can be applied to other relationships as well. So if so- someone is finding themselves in a dysfunctional relationship, what's the first thing they should do? I think the most important first step is to avoid denial. And denial is a a, a self-protective mechanism where sometimes the reality is so harsh that you're afraid to admit to what is happening. And in couples relationship, it could be that the husband is having an affair and the signs are there, but the wife just cannot bring herself to admit that this is happening and so the signs are showing up and it's not been talked about it's just been pushed away it could be in a household to where there is incest and uh, sadly enough there are sometimes when even children have come forward to say dad did this to me and uh, the mother goes into denial because this cannot be happening in our household. And so instead of taking action, they push it away. And so I think the first very important step is to look at the facts. Don't let the emotion of fear uh, cause you to go into denial because if you go into denial, that what you're actually doing is to make the situation becomes wor- become worse because you are putting off dealing with it. And the longer you take to deal with it, the more these dysfunctional roots grow deeper and become more, more entrenched. And the more people in the sit- those situation, including yourself, will suffer from the effects of that. So it's not surprising that in Matthew 18, Jesus tells us, that if your brother be overtaken with a fault, that you should go and talk to your brother, and and it 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 is this kind of of approach that is necessary instead of denial, talking about it. Jesus goes a step further to say, not only do you need to talk about it, but if the dis- if the dysfunction continues, take witnesses, bring it to the bring it to others, and so it's important to confront the situation in an attempt to change it, not to not go into denial and let it continue. So once we've brought the situation to light, we've taken the cobwebs out of the closet and we're fully aware of what's going on, what other right. steps should we do to survive those dysfunctional An relationships? An important step that is also in the Matthew 18 principle is not to isolate. If you notice the 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 the, the 
the, the import of that verse that they have just referred to in Matthew 18, that passage that they have referred to in Matthew 18, it talks about involving others. It talks about taking witnesses. It talks about involving the church if your brother refuses to, to, to admit to what is going on. And so I think this is saying to us that don't go through this by yourself because uh, isolation is very dangerous for a number of reasons. Number one, if you're isolated, you're likely your resources for dealing with it is likely to be very limited and likely to be depleted very easily. If you have others around you, you have more resources to cope with the situation, but also more resources in terms of coming up with solution to the problem. So Jesus was was pointing to these facts by saying, "No, don't do it alone. Don't try to solve these situations that that are persisting." Despite your attempts to deal with it alone. Don't isolate. Get others involved and, and deal with the situation with others. So how do be people become isolated? Isolation can happen uh, as a result of a number of factors. It can be as a result of overt uh, control tactics, for example. A person who is abusive in a relationship might forbid you from talking to others about the problem if, or, or threaten you. You know, if you talk to anyone, if you tell anyone about what's going on, I'm going to end this relationship. And so that fear uh, con- causes people to isolate and to and to suffer in silence alone and sadly enough i know because i speak to many people across all churches in ottawa and, and, and the surrounding areas and there are a lot of people who are hurting who have who have been hurting for years and they are suffering in silence because they, 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 there is so much pride in the person that they are living with that no one can know, no one should know what I am going on. So these kind of threats, if you ever tell anyone, I will leave you, is contrary to what Jesus teaches in Matthew 18 because Jesus teaches that, no, if you are trying and the situation persists, involve others. So we have the, ask me how isolation, the form it takes place, and so we have these overt kinds of of, of uh, isolation, but we also have it done in more covert ways as well, where a person might not really say, don't tell anyone, but they make it, they, 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 the first time you might have talked to a friend or a family member, they withdraw love from you and they don't talk to you for several days and they sulk. And so even though they're not saying in the one, they're sending you the message that if you do this, this is what the kind of treatment that you will get. You'll get the silent treatment, the stone wall, according to John Gottman. And so this stone walling that takes place uh, over time creates the effect of having you uh, desist from speaking to others about what you're going through in your relationship. But regardless of the the, the form that uh, isolation takes, it's very important for you to, to realize that it, it it's very detrimental to your health, to your relationship, if you allow isolation to take place. We need others around us to support us, to help us, to give us that objective third party. Because if you have a dysfunctional person around you and the only voice you're hearing is what this dysfunctional person is saying to you, what happens in that situation after a while you become very confused about, am I really you know, approaching the situation the real way? Maybe it's me. Maybe I'm the problem. Maybe I'm just too, 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 uh, too critical. Or maybe I'm making a big deal about anything. So sometimes people will come to me after years of isolation and they say, I'm coming to you because you're the only safe person. I can't talk to anyone in my church. And so I'm coming to you and they say, am I crazy? Is, it, is there something wrong with the way I'm looking at this situation? And when they outline the situation to me, I'm saying, no, this is really a very grave and sad situation that is taking place in your family. You have all rights to to be trying to correct this this dysfunctional situation that's going on in your household. 
If you've just joined us, you're listening to the Life Transformation Radio Show. Today, we're talking about surviving dysfunctional relationships. If you've missed the first half of today's show, we encourage you to listen to it on our website at elamcounselingministry.com. Elam is spelled E-L-I-M, counseling with two L's, ministry.com. Or you can call us at 613-699-1677, and we'd be happy to send you a copy of today's show. So, so far, Michael, we've talked about avoiding denial, Avoiding isolation as a strategy to uh, survive dysfunctional relationships. Mm -hmm. What other things should people be doing? I think the third important point to to keep in mind is that you should not enable. And there are times when we enable dysfunction by rewarding it or or by allowing it to to keep happening, by, by feeding it. And so an example of that would be, let us say, someone in the household as a gambling problem and they have a, an important bill to pay and they, because of the addiction, they gamble away that money to pay that bill. And then you say, okay, I can't allow you to suffer by not paying that bill that you have to pay and so I'm going to pay it for you. And so if you pay that bill, what you're indeed doing is subsidizing the gambling habit. Or it could be a husband who has alcohol problem and he goes out and he drinks and he has a hangover and he's not able to go to work the next day. And so you take it on as a responsibility to call his workplace and say, you know, my husband is very sick. He won't be coming into work today. And so whereas he's, he's drunk, he's, he's having a hangover from being drunk the night before. And so you're saving his job. And as long as you're saving his job, you might think the situation is not that bad because, you see, I can still function. I'm able to hold down a job. I'm able to work. And, and as long as you keep doing this, you're enabling the behavior. And in, in Christian circles, you know, the Bible calls on us to do good to others. And this can also be, this can be confused for, for, uh, a license to enable, where people will say, well, you know, uh, the Bible says I'm to do good, so I'm just helping the person out, or I love the person so much that even though they're doing all of those bad things, I still have to be kind and do all of this. And so you have enabling continue. And sometimes where people think that they're following Christian principles of doing good to others who are who are being dysfunctional towards them, they're actually not doing it from a good motive. They're doing it because they they feel weak and they feel incapable of taking any kind of action. And this is this is the a, a principle, uh, a, a defense mechanism that that is called reaction formation, where when someone feels powerless in a relationship to change the situation. Instead of coming out and saying, you know what, I'm really powerless, I can't do anything to change it, they do the opposite. They create a reaction that's the opposite of what they feel. So instead of instead of telling the person that, look, you need to get help and I'm not going to support your, your drug habit in a way because of fear and powerlessness, they subsidize the drug habit, they pay for their apartments, they they keep bailing them out over and over and over again. In other words, they make uh, it easy for them to continue in the dysfunctional relationship. How do you, though, end up breaking that cycle? Because as you said, sometimes it's motivated out of fear and sometimes the consequences for, in some people's minds of not having whether it's the money or whatnot to supply a habit or to hold down a job, those excuses, et cetera, the consequences of that are really, really frightening for some people. Absolutely. So how do you how do you break that? Yeah. So so th- that's very that's a very good question, Melissa, because some of what we are talking about here is hard. The example of a use of a uh, a, a wife who will call and say, "My husband is sick. He can't come into work today," and really the truth is he's having a hangover. In that example, the consequences to that are grave, right? Yeah. Like, like if that's your if that's your paycheck, paying your mortgage, putting clothes on your kids' back food and etc. Right. If he loses that job, there's other consequences to the family, not discounting the consequences of having someone suffering from alcoholism in the Absolutely. house as well. Yes, but it's yes. it's it's so 
it's so muddy. So yes, how do you it, break that it, down? It is. It is very, very difficult situation. But I think it comes down to understanding that as long as you live in fear of what the consequences might be, and in fear of, for example, the financial ramifications of not calling to 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 make an excuse for my husband absence from work. As long as you live in that fear, you are you are contributing to the behavior continuing. So I think it, it the first step is to realize that your 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 enabling has been driven by fear. The second thing is to realize that in this situation, to stop enabling, it takes an act of faith. It takes a trust in God to say, God, I do not know how this is going to work out, but I know that you're not the kind of God who is calling me to support sinful behavior. And so even though the consequences of standing up for righteousness and doing what's right, what I know is morally right, is grave, I'm going to take this step of faith to trust you with my future. There are many women who have stayed in very abusive relationship for years because they feel my husband is the breadwinner. And if I were to leave this relationship, then how am I going to survive? But then this is, this is a, a fear that is stopping them from doing what's right. And so your husband might or might not lose his job. Maybe if this employer finds out, he might be uh, given the resources to get help. Right. If you leave a dysfunctional relationship, you might not necessarily end the relationship. You might not live in poverty. You will, you will have help uh, from sources, uh, some governmental sources, and there may be family members that will come around you to help you. And you're, you're the person, once you take that step of stopping the enabling, that might be an opportunity for the person to finally get the help that they need. So as long as you live in fear of the consequences, you are limiting the hand of God to move in your situation. And I see that we are we are out of time for today, Melissa, and, and uh, we still have four more four more uh, sections to go. And so uh, tune in again next week when we'll be covering we'll be continuing the second part of the surviving in a dysfunctional relationship series and giving you uh, four more tips as to how to survive when you're in a dysfunctional relationship. It was great to join you again, Michael. Thank you for answering my questions. I'll make sure they're extra tough next week. <laughs> okay, I'll have, to, I'll have to prepare even harder. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much for listening to this episode of the Life Transformation Radio Show. If you want to contact us, if you heard something today that stir your heart and you feel that it is speaking to you and you'd like to reach out to us and let us know. We would really appreciate it. You can get a hold of us by calling 613-699-1677 or you can go to our website at elamcounselingministry.com. So until next time, this is your host, Michael Hart of Elam Counseling Services and Melissa Waggett praying together that God would bless you in all your relationships and keep you sound in mind and pure in heart.